Hello, hello. This is Kim Addis from Frame of Mind Coaching, and you have just joined the Frame of Mind Coaching Podcast. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce to you a young woman who is driven, passionate, full of vim and vigor. Her name is Haley Rogers. Haley, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. So uh, you and I met through your stepmom. She is a coach of ours. Her name is Lynn Stevens. And she reached out to me because she said, hey, my stepdaughter is really interested in coaching. And can she talk to you about it? So why don't we start there? Like what makes you interested in coaching? What brings you there? Yeah, so I kind of got interested in coaching after writing my first ever book, See Me. Uh, Basically with my book, it was a self-help book geared towards young adults and aims to inspire young adults to live an authentic life through guiding principles. And so I really realized that after writing this book, I I have this intrinsic like motivation to help and serve others. And Lynn kind of exposed me to Kim's book uh, and I absolutely loved it. And I think that this drive in me to help and serve other people can be really found in coaching. And that's kind of what interested me. Okay, so you just gave me a lot to work with here. You wrote a book? Yes, I did. And I published it in December 2019. 2019. So you are 20 now. When was this book published? How old were you? I'm 19 years old. 19 years old. So what inspired you to write a book? Like how many 19 year old people write and publish books? Yeah, so it was kind of an unexpected opportunity. So I've been writing for a media publisher called Her Campus for about a year prior. And so in January 2019, My friend Julia, she got a message from a Georgetown professor in the States, and he basically presented her this whole book writing opportunity through his program called Creator Institute. And it's basically, he takes young adults who have a passion for writing, but don't even realize that they um, have the potential to write a book. So she said, Haley, do you want to get involved in this? And I said, this seems kind of sketchy because it's just this random guy messaging you on LinkedIn saying you should write a book in a year. I'm like, well, you know what? Why the heck not? I have a huge passion for mental health and I have a huge passion for writing. And so when I got talking on my first initial phone call with the professor, he kind of inspired me to write this whole self-help book geared towards young adults. And he said that he could really see this whole passion for authenticity in me and that that is kind of like how I should go about writing a book. So it was very, very unexpected. I'd never thought I'd even be an author at all, but it was an opportunity that I thought um, really aligned well with who I am. So it's interesting that you thought that he was sketchy, but you decided to kind of figure that out anyways. Yeah, yeah. I I figured I had absolutely nothing to lose. I loved writing. And if I was going to write a ton of content, then it ended up being some big scam. I could share it with the world regardless. I'd have a manuscript and I'd figure out a way. I think it was just one of those things is why not? Why not do it? You know? Okay. So how long did it take you? And how did you go about the book writing process? So many people I know, guests on my podcast, clients of ours, are really interested in writing a book, but they feel like it's daunting. How did you go about that? Yeah, absolutely. So the amount of time per se always fluctuated. It was a matter of just being consistent, always allocating time during the day, whether it be 30 minutes one day or 12 hours the next day. But going about it, um, it was a very interesting process because all he um, told us to do was to just start with a simple story with a simple idea. So it was kind of writing various chapters um, for about three-ish months um, that kind of tied back into authenticity. So I remember uh, my first story is about a girl named Ann Pye, and she founded um, a nonprofit organization called Step Above Stigma, which I'm also involved with. And it basically, um, her story relates to the idea of whether you think you can or you can't, you're right. So that's kind of how um, I went about different principles throughout the story. But then the introduction came much, much later and a clear thesis statement kind of developed into itself. So I think my biggest advice for if someone wants to start a book is to just start. You don't have to have a clear thesis statement. You don't have to have a clear structure or clear introduction. It's just a matter of getting the pen to paper. Okay. So now you wrote about being authentic, particularly for young people. What do you think prevents people from being authentic? I think we have a very conventionally driven society. Um, it's very hard, particularly with young people. When I find that we're very, very confused and we're trying to navigate the world um, 
kind of on our own, but we need some sort of guidance. So we kind of stick to these conventional rules our society has kind of made for us. And so that kind of inhibits us from pursuing our passions, from following our dreams and goals, from just staying true to who we are in all facets of life. So I think that that's what the biggest issue is for young adults is to get rid of those conventionally driven norms and to just stay true to your heart and uh, stay true to who you are. So do you think that, you know, the norms confuse young people because they seek, let's call it approval, acceptance, and, and so they can't really hear for themselves or see for themselves who their authentic self is? Is that what's at play here? Yeah, absolutely. Like there's, there's, um, I can use a particular example. There was uh, a guy in my book who, um, he went to post-secondary education just because he felt like he had to for his parents. Very, very common. And he realized it just wasn't for him. Um, but he decided instead of sticking with it, he followed his passions for music and he now builds drums, uh, for all these famous Canadian bands. So I think that's, a big thing is that sometimes, oftentimes actually we feel very quite stuck, um, whereas he felt stuck, but he got out of it. I think that was a, that's a really big thing that we see is that we always feel stuck with these rules and we can carry them into like, well, at least I've seen it with other adults who've carried them with them till their forties. So it's a matter of like getting rid of those rules and being true to who you are now while you're young. So that way you don't have any regrets when you're older. More than 40. Yeah. So what you're really saying is that a lot of times we live our lives according to the expectations of what other people think we should be doing. Yes. And that plays tricks with us and has, and that, that kind of construct um, causes us to get lost and forget what it is that we really, really want. Yeah, exactly. It's kind of a matter of like, saying we're kind of caught between who we are and who we think we have to be and I think it's getting rid of that whole we have to be this person we have to live this way um and actually just I think the most successful and happy you'll ever feel as soon as you decide to stay true to your heart and follow your passions because your passions can be you can your work your job can be your passion you don't have to pick a job because it's better financially you can make yourself make money and um, actually pursue your passions. So Okay, so I want to switch gears here for a minute because you are interested. I mean, it's remarkable that you wrote a book. Obviously, you're one of these like go-getters and you're a person who wants to make a massive difference in the world. And you think that coaching might be a good way to do that. But before we jump into coaching, let's kind of back up a little bit. You experienced therapy at some point what was the driver? Why did you go to therapy? What was it that you were looking for help with? Absolutely. So I've been in and out of therapy from about grade nine to first year of university. So I had multiple therapists. It had to do with a lot of anxiety and depression that I was experiencing, like many um, young adults do experience throughout those times. Um, the main drive was to uh, get almost overcome uh, these feelings of anxiety and depression, but more importantly, I was looking for a purpose um, outside of academia. I was a very, very strong academic in high school, and when I went to university, I really struggled with the fact that I was no longer the top of the class. My grades were dropping, so it was a matter of trying to find that purpose and coming to terms with all the other stuff that was going on in my life at the time, so I think I was looking for a tool to kind of like allow me to overcome um, some of the stuff that I was going through in high school and especially looking for a purpose. So therapy was very useful, it was helpful, but still you think that perhaps there's maybe a stigma associated with it or it has a certain level of use and then at some point perhaps coaching is a, a better or a different option for young people. Talk to me about your thinking around that. Yeah, so when I went to therapy, I thought I was going to get a bunch of tools and ways that I can go about um, overcoming the past so that I could build myself a, a future that was alignment, in alignment with my passions and purpose. But what I found with therapy is that when I was uh, there, I found we were 
talking about my past story, not my future story. So I didn't come out of therapy with any sort of um, idea of what to do next. I was kind of in a position where I was stuck. So after therapy for about four or five months before I even got involved with writing for her campus or getting involved with that organization, I was in this period of just, it was very, I felt very, I didn't have a purpose per se. I really just didn't feel like I had any sort of direction afterwards. And that's where I think coaching could come into play. Um, I find that I was just, I was found that I was looking for someone to kind of pull the passions out from in me. I'd always been a passionate writer and always been a passionate um, marketer, particularly for things that I enjoyed, but I just never went for it. I was fortunate at the time, five months later, that I did come across these platforms, but had I had a coach that I think that they would have pushed me in the right direction um, much, much sooner. And I can see coaching being so effective in other aspects of my life, particularly like when I was in high school, I had a huge, huge confidence issue and self-esteem issue that I really, really need to work on. I can see it playing a role in my life now, um, especially what I'm going to do after graduation, um, helping me build more confidence in public speaking. There's so many aspects of coaching that could help young people um, kind of allow them to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Mm -hmm. for sure. So I can envision you being an amazing coach because you're doing a lot of personal development work. And what we have discovered at Frame of Mind Coaching is that the best coaches are completely dedicated to not only leadership, but their own personal development. Because when they do the work, they're able to show up for their clients, you know, in, in, a, in a healthy state. And when you're in a healthy state, you're, you're able to see what a client is struggling with and help them to move past it and help them to identify that direction that they're looking for. And, you know, it's interesting as a coach, we're not here to say, here's your direction, but we're here to help you find it. And we're here to help you sort through some of the beliefs, some of the cloudiness that you might experience that might prevent you from accessing that clarity. So that's really what you're talking about when you're talking about the distinction between coaching and therapy. Exactly. And like, yeah. because I've, I've written this book for young adults and trying to help them, I feel like coaching would just further carry that passion that I have for helping and serving others, particularly young adults, just because I am a young adult. I, I really, the issues that we experience and the challenges we face, it really, really resonates with me. And I think that becoming a coach for youth specifically and as a young adult, it one, like it build more of a personal like relationship and yeah, it further helped me um, do my purpose of helping and serving others. And I think that it's, it's, I haven't seen very many coaches for young adults, but it's a huge market that could have huge demand. It's a matter of um, exposing that need. Um, I, I, wanna, I wanted to kind of switch gears a little bit. Um, what I've discovered since meeting you is that you're a bit of a... Um, a social media guru? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So like what platforms on you are you on? What is your approach? Like what makes you good at this? I don't think everybody's just naturally good at this. And really what I want to do right now is like teach some of our adult listeners a few you know tricks of the trade from uh, a veteran right here. So yeah. teach us what platforms are you on and what is your typical approach? Yeah, absolutely. So I utilize Facebook and Instagram. Instagram is really good for young people. Um, and then Facebook is really good for an older demographic. So Facebook, I, have, I use Facebook pages and I kind of, for that, it's more so for my um, more adult crowd who actually enjoyed a lot of adults are actually reading my book too because they kind of want to understand a younger perspective. So uh, I cater to them through Facebook, just making posts um, every two to three days, usually in the morning because that's when most people actually use their um, Facebook. But Instagram more specifically, I've been uh, collaborating with other organizations on Instagram, such as like podcast, um, youth kind of like organizations. And all I've been doing is messaging them, telling them about my story, and asking for a collaboration. So I think the biggest thing is asking, like, do not be afraid to sell yourself. Um, that was something that really 
I was really scared of doing after publishing my book, but it's more so just taking that brave step and being like, I have an offering. I'd love to collaborate with you. And the worst thing they can do is say no, or they don't even say anything at all. Um, I've also been marking my book through, um, influencers, particularly reading influencers. So basically there's thousands of accounts out there who basically just post, uh, books they've read and reviews with, with those posts. And so I've been reaching out, uh, about, to 30 people every single day since January. And I have about 400 people reading my book, but it's not like I'm actually sending them a physical copy. I'm sending them an ebook. So it's free for me. So kind of utilizing other people, making them feel important. Um, so like my approach is like, I came across your profile. I love what you're doing. Uh, I think you'd be an excellent fit for me uh, to promote my book. Um, I'd love to send you a free copy. And that kind of makes them feel important and it also makes it kind of exclusive. So they'll respond really well to that. Um, so do you, do you, like, what's the response rate? Like, let's say you send, I don't know, I'm making up a number, a hundred reach outs asking for somebody to look at and review your book and write a positive, uh, testimonial, let's call it. How many people respond? How many people reject you? How many people don't answer you? What's the, what's the rate? Um, well, in the beginning when I had absolutely like no, like testimonies or anything, it was a lot harder. So I would maybe get like 10 out of a hundred at the beginning. So it is a ton of work, but it it's totally worth it because you reach thousands and thousands and thousands. But now that I have actual, um, yeah, so now that I have actual, uh, yeah, so anyway, so now that I have an actual, like, um, platform that's building with more and more testimonies, um, more people are a bit responsive, so I sent out 20 messages yesterday, and 15 responded, so it's, it, wow. yeah, so it does really increase over time as you get more credibility, um, obviously, it was actually, well, not funny, but my first ever review was a bad one. So that was an experience for me. It was a bad one. And um, because I was saying I wanted honest reviews because I didn't want to just be like, hey, can you say that my product's great? I don't want that. I want honest. And uh, my first review was a bad one. So after I'd sent out 100 ebooks and the first one was a bad review, that I, I panicked. But honestly, at this point in my life, I've come to the idea that any publicity is good publicity like it's still people still so what did you do when you got that bad review did you answer the guy did you say thank you so much for your review or like or, or did you change your book what did you do i responded i thank you for your honest feedback this might help me in the future with my writing thank you for taking the time to read it the only way to respond to those kinds of people is to not get angry or upset because it's just one person's opinion um because i had other people like my friends and stuff like obviously you, your friends tell, sometimes tell you what they want to hear but I've had very genuine reviews from people and I had to I had to keep focused on the good over the bad that was kind of like my perspective is like I cannot let this one review just completely annihilate all of the work that I had done I'm not gonna let it just take over this massive achievement so it was kind of like yeah I just I had this like concept of a 24-hour rule so I give myself 24 hours to basically have a hissy fit over it and then I have to move on because the, if I get stuck, then I, I won't be able to promote myself as much as I can. And um, I won't be able to carry myself. If so I... here, here's what's funny, right? Like you say, hey, you know, I struggle with a little confidence. But people over here listening on this side of the podcast are thinking, man, I wish I had that much confidence. I wish that I had that much resilience. I wish I could handle rejection the way she did. I wish I had the confidence to just ask right? So many people just don't ask for help, for a review, for, because they're afraid, they're not comfortable with the rejection. So it's very interesting to me that, you know, you perceive yourself as lacking confidence, but the truth is that, man, you have a lot of confidence compared to a lot of people I know. So my hat's off to you. Thank you. Yeah. I think confidence is something that can always be worked on. Like for me, like, um, obviously public speaking is my mate. And so as an introvert, I can use social media as a tool for myself. Um, Why do you call yourself an introvert? I, I like, I get overstimulated in a lot of um, social situations. So if I go out 
for a night, I'll need a week to recover. Or um, if I have a conversation like for an hour, I'll need six hours by myself to just calm. I'm very, very like I get overstimulated by social interactions, but I'm also like I do have an extroverted side in me as well. But I really like uh, quiet and stillness and honestly doing my own thing. I'm very much an independent soul. So um, I guess social media for me became this tool where I don't actually have to see the person. I have nothing to lose, especially if it's social media, all I have to do is ask. So it is helping a lot with my confidence because I've been able to approach people and it's, it's kind of translating over to other aspects of my life, which um, has been a lot more helpful. But yeah, confidence for me is something that I believe I can always, always improve. Um, I think it's something everybody can always improve too. So let me share with you something. I wrote an article, I don't even know when, a year or two, three years ago, I don't remember. I write a lot as well. Uh, but the article was about this whole concept that sometimes people call themselves introverted. Mm -hmm. And my question is like, does calling yourself introverted actually help you? Does it actually serve you? Does that label empower you? What yeah. is it actually doing for you? Yeah, well, before, like sometimes I'll use introverted in a way that kind of helps convey why I don't prefer getting up in front of people and speaking, but I read a book called Quiet by Susan Cain, I believe that's her name, and it actually started to empower me because I really realized the strengths of an introvert. I realized that my creativity, my productivity, um, my ability to think of outside the box and all these other things came from the fact that I was introverted, and so I've really realized how much of an asset that was to me, especially in writing, and especially the fact that I want to become a coach because I really do appreciate one-on-one -on -one meaningful interactions, and that was one of the qualities that um, Kane explained in her book. So yeah, it's definitely an empowering thing now, especially um, after publishing a book, I see how much value it is to be an introvert, but sometimes I'll use it in a way to explain like why I get overstimulated speaking. So I, I think that you're filled with talents. I think that you sometimes need quiet time. So do I. I think that sometimes you receive a lot of stimulation and sometimes you need some time to process that. And I think that that's all good. It's all okay. I do think that labels, any labels are limiting. And we have to be careful about the labels we embrace, right? Yeah. So, and there's a big distinction there. I, I want to switch gears again because I read a, 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 an article on your blog that totally excited me. Uh, it was an article, I don't remember the title, but it was this concept of why. Why is not the right question. Asking why. And so I want you to share a little bit about what... Um, why you wrote that particular article and where that comes from. Then I want to share with you my opinion on the question why. So go ahead. Yeah. So this whole kind of concept of like this whole idea came to me. I had a conversation with a friend and he was telling me that his friend wrote an essay on a final exam. And the question was why? And all the, the student, he just wrote down, why not? And he got a hundred on this paper. And that really hit me because I think a lot of us spend time asking why. And I think it's a very, it's a, sometimes it can be for curiosity, but at the same time, it's kind of sometimes cynical. It's, I, I find there's a connotation behind the concept of why that kind of holds you back. But whereas if you use the word or the concept of why not, I think it takes off limits and makes you, it, it, yeah, there is, it shows you that there really is no uh, reason why you can't do something. So asking why not anytime you're about to pursue something, anytime you're about to um, engage in a new passion, asking yourself why not, it'll, it'll push you in that direction that um, you're meant to go. So a lot of times people say, I need to find my why, right? What's my why? And my philosophy is my why, your why, his why, her why, they're all the same reason. The, the reason you want anything is because you believe it's going to make you feel better. It's going to be fulfilling. It's going to give you a good experience. It's going to lead you to a positive emotional state. So 
you might choose the direction of writing a book. You might choose to coach people. You might choose to, um, you know, figure out how to overcome your confidence or, you know, the, the insecurities you have around public speaking because you believe that all those things are going to lead you to a positive emotional state. It's going to feel good once you get there, right? And so your why isn't different for, from anybody else's why. The real question is why not, right? Exactly how you said. And really the question is like, what's stopping you from doing that? What are the beliefs? What is the thinking that is getting in the way from you going for what you want? For me, that's the more complex question, right? Yeah, that's exactly what I was trying to target. It's the whole concept that like, when you're asking why you're limiting yourself, whereas if you ask yourself, why not, you really can't come up with an answer. You'll kind of go in circles. Like I find like if I ask myself, why not, like I'll try to justify it, but you really can't justify why not. You can't, it's, you, it's. Well, but sometimes why not allows you to see the thinking that keeps you trapped and stuck, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. So what do you think you will achieve as a result of coaching? Last question. I think getting, getting coached, you mean? Yeah. Getting coached myself. Well, for me, like one thing is I do want to become a coach. So it'll allow me to understand the coaching process, which is really, I think, and obviously what you've told me as we discussed that in order to become a coach, you have to be coached. Like you, your analogy with, I think it was like, if you're going to be a football coach, you've had to play football. It doesn't make sense if you don't, um, if you haven't played the game. So that's one thing. But for me, it's the one thing I want to take away from coaching is definitely um, building some, developing um, more so like my sh strengths and weaknesses. So for me, I, I filled out the survey and I definitely want to work on my confidence and um, I guess ex allowing myself to, yeah, I think it's definitely a confidence thing that I really want to target is being confident in how I speak, um, perhaps presenting. That's why I really want to take away from coaching and understanding like what kind of self-limiting beliefs I currently have about my confidence and how I can overcome them. I think that's a major thing. Let me give you a tip. Mm -hmm. Okay, so calling yourself an introvert doesn't help you be confident. <laughs> Even though you may have characteristics that are traditionally defined as introverted, by itself, it creates a limitation. Yeah. Okay, so you're just this person who sometimes needs downtime. Yeah. Me too. <laughs> right? Yeah. Haley, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for being on this podcast, for sharing your story for being one of these young, go-getting, uh, driven individuals who takes it upon herself to do things like write their own books and gets them published, who stands here and says, why not? Let me go ask a bunch of people. Uh, I love that about you. I love your initiative. I've experienced quite a bit of it so far. We've only been talking for about a week. I'm like just totally tickled by uh, the way that you stand up, the way you take ownership, the way you ask, the way you take things on. You're an amazing role model for so many people. Thank you. How do people find your book? Uh, it's available on Amazon. So tell us again, what is the title of your book? See Me Becoming Your Authentic Self by Haley Rogers. Again, it's See Me Becoming Your Authentic Self by Haley with an E, right? H-A-L-E-Y Rogers, R-O-D-G-E-R-S. <laughs> Thank you, Haley. It was an absolute pleasure having you on the podcast. Thank you.